we have, she, there's a guest over. And oddly, the guest chose Thursday night. I don't know. It's not like we have standing obligations. I don't know. All right. Now, if you got your Bible, or something with your Bible on it, as I meander slowly, <laughs> I meander, not you, Matt. wouldn't dare say that. If you would be kind enough to lift up your Bible and repeat after me, once it's up there, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I will never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> oh, I love our church. So tonight, we are finishing up what, was, what I thought was going to be two weeks and has turned into three, about the attributes of God. And so I am going to recap the first many points that we made, and then we'll get to it. And this might not take long. We'll see what happens. And I'm in a metal building, so lightning would ground, so don't you worry about me. The first attribute of God that we talked about is that God is infinite. He is self-existing and he is without origin. There is no mom or dad to God. There is just God. And there is no before God. There's just God. Now, for some people, that breaks their brain. There's a reason I don't think about things like that too much. It gives me a headache. I don't like having a headache. So, it's something that we have to take on faith. That's not a bad thing. The second thing, oh, and my favorite identifier of God as being God is in Exodus 3.14 in the Amplified Classic. He's talking to Moses, and Moses is talking to, uh, so it's the pre-incarnate Christ talking to Moses through the burning bush. We know it's the pre-incarnate Christ because Exodus 3 says that the angel of the Lord showed up. And when it's the angel of the Lord, it's Jesus before he was born. And so in Exodus 3, Moses is talking to the angel, and he says, well, who do I say sent me? You know, it's all well and good. I'll go and I'll talk to the people, but who do I say sent me? And in verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. I love that. It almost feels like God is kind of puffing his chest up. You know who I am? I am. I am who I am, and I am what I am, and I'll be what I'll be. Now, God doesn't have to puff his chest. He is omnipotent, which we're going to get to in a minute. He doesn't have to, but, it, you know, I kind of get that <laughs> image of God. The second one we talked about is how God is immutable. That's the fancy word for saying he never changes. Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always the same, yesterday and today and forever. And in James 1.17, we're told that every good and perfect thing given, is given from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. The third thing is that God is self-sufficient. God has no needs. In John 5, 26, Jesus says, For just as the Father has life in himself and is self-existent, even so he has given to the Son to have life in himself and be self-existent. What it means, the way we can think about that, is that God doesn't need us. We desperately need God. But God doesn't need us. And some people think that sounds cold. 
but that shows the truth that God doesn't need us. He wants us. He has a desire for us. He has a passion for us, which is so much better than a need. These next three are what we call the omni statements, because omni means all. The first one is that God is omnipotent, means he is all-powerful. If you can imagine it, God can do it. He, Ephesians 3.20 even says that he is able to do infinitely and abundantly above anything that we could ever ask or think. There is nothing that's too hard for God. But keeping that in balance, because people say, well, if God's all-powerful, why didn't he do this for me? To which the response is, did you let him? Our unbelief can limit God. God loves us enough, and we're going to get to God's love in a bit. God loves us enough to stay in the box that we put him in in our lives. If there's a hurt or a habit or a hang-up that we hold and we treasure and we have put part of our identity around, God wants to heal it and restore it. But he won't if you don't let him. Because as I like to say, and I... I've said it before, I'll say it again. I stole this from my dad. I think he stole it from someone else, but I don't know who who he stole it from. God is always the perfect gentleman. He will never take what you don't give. He will never go where you don't let him. And he will never do what you don't ask him. The next point is that God is omniscient. That means that God is all-knowing. Because to God, eternity has started and finished. He is outside of time and space. And that's one of the things that I don't think about too much. (laughs) The Bible proves it's true. I believe it. I take it on faith. But I don't think about it because I don't want my head to hurt. It's a simple thing. Now, people will think that God being all-knowing eliminates our free will when that is not the case. You see, God operates outside of our understanding. And if we go to Romans 8, 29 through 31, I'm not going to read it, but that's where my defense is found in the Bible. It starts and says, for whom he foreknew, he predestined. God knows all the decisions we're going to make. He knows all the screw-ups. He knows all the successes. He knows the words we're going to speak. And he uses that knowledge to craft his plan to come out the way he wants it to come out, the way he has determined it needs to come out. He is all-knowing. He knows every variable. And people think, well, that means that I'm only going where God wants me to go. You don't know that yet. God knows all the choices you're going to make. You don't. I don't. I barely know what I'm going to be doing in an hour and a half. I mean, it's 7.30, so it'll be 9. I'll be getting ready for bed. But, <laughs> but I don't know the choices I'm going to make. And God will never violate my free will and take away my ability to choose. Because if he did, that would violate who he is. And God cannot deny himself. He cannot go against his nature. And the last of the omnis is that God is omnipresent. It means he is always everywhere. And in the Old Testament, we know that's true, even back in Genesis. Genesis 1-2 tells us that before God shaped the earth, when he was formed, after he formed it from nothing, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering and moving over the face of the waters before God started shaping and molding it. The Holy Spirit is always there. And you can't, what is it, David says in Psalm 55? Or 73, one of those. Where can I go that you're not? If I go to the highest heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths of the grave, you're there. If I move from east to west at the speed of light, you're already there. And it gets more intense for us as New Testament believers because one of the things that happens when you accept Christ is in that instant, you are given the fullness of the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead which is the Bible term for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we as New Testament believers, not only is the Holy Spirit everywhere on the earth, He lives inside us. 
So you can't go where he's not because you brought him here with you. (laughs) You took him wherever you were. People don't like to live that way. People don't like to acknowledge it. But that doesn't make it less true. The next one we have is that God is wise. He is full of perfect and unchanging wisdom. And it's worth pointing out now that all of these attributes and these traits of God don't exist in isolation. It's not that God is omnipotent in this box and he's omnipresent in this box and he is omniscient in this box. I had to remember the third one. It's not that he's self-sufficient over here and he's without origin and self-existing over here. No, no, no. It's all part of one thing. It's just traits that we can pick out. What were you going to say? It's part of the whole. That's right. And so God being wise feels like it naturally occurs because God is all-knowing. And there's another part of this that we're going to get to, but God is the only one who's able to see all ends. He's the only one who knows where everyone's heart is. God's the only one who truly knows our heart, even when we don't. The next one I have is that God is faithful. He is infinitely and unchangingly true. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, do not believe and are untrue to him. He remains true, faithful to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot deny himself. If we truly believe these next attributes of God that we're going to go through, and even looking at the ones we've already seen how God is wise, how God is all-knowing, and he is faithful to himself, which means he's faithful to the promises that he has made us. It means he's faithful to the gifts that he has given us. He's not going to give us something and then go, I'm sorry, I know I gave that to you, and you've had it for like five years. I kind of need it. Can I I just get that? No, he's never going to do that. The next one is that God, and this one sounds really simple, but God is good. He is infinitely and unchangingly kind and full of goodwill towards us. What is it? It's Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. Blessed, which means happy, happy, fortunate, and to be envied, is the man who trusts and takes refuge in him. One of our most popular things that you hear in religion and you hear in churchy environments is that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying people just say it. They don't always believe it. They'll say it when they're here, and then they cuss God for not doing what they think he ought to be doing out in the world. And people will ask, because again, I'm trying to keep this stuff in balance. People will ask, well, if God is so good, why is this world so evil? Why do bad things keep happening? Why is the world getting darker and darker? Well, the answer is very simple, but not a lot of people like it. Satan is in control of this world for the time being. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, dominion, meaning control and rule, over this world were given from Adam to Satan. He is the little g God of this world. And he goes about seeking that whom he may devour. Like a roaring lion, for he knows his time is short. Until, and it'll be that way, until Jesus comes back after the, at the end of the tribulation. And then it's going to be wonderful because Satan's going to get chained up and thrown into a bottomless pit. And I genuinely believe that in my mansion in glory, wherever it is, whatever it looks like, there's going to be TVs in the hallways of live stream of Satan just still falling. Just so I can look by and know and kind of laugh that he's still falling the way he should be. <laughs> People will say, well, why, do, why doesn't God intervene? This goes back to what I said about when God is, how God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Do we let God 
in our lives? Do we acknowledge the fact that by being a Christian, we are working against the ruler of this world? And that all of a sudden we're worth fighting because we're soldiers for Christ and we're not working on the, the devil's team anymore? Because we should tell people that right after they get saved. Your eternity is going to be so much better, but life on earth might not get better right away. Not telling you to expect disaster, but you're going to be fought harder than you have been just because you're saved. And the devil's a little mad that you get to spend eternity in heaven and he doesn't. <laughs> you, yes, he does. He does. That's why in John 10, Jesus said the, it's the enemy who's come to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, but I came that they might have a life and have it more abundantly. The next attribute of God is that God is just. He is infinitely, unchangeably right and perfect in all that he does. <clears throat> I love Jeremiah 10.10, 10, how it talks about how he talks about God in the beginning, but the Lord is the true God and the God of truth. The God who is truth. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations are not able to bear his indignation. And Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should tell or act a lie. Neither is the son of, neither the son of man that he should feel repentance or compunction for what he has promised. Has he said and he shall not do it? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? God is true to his word. And again, this works together with God being all-knowing, all-powerful, and being perfectly wise. God knows what justice is. Now he tells us that justice in the Old Testament, and James talks about it in the New Testament as true religion, is taking care of those who can't take care of themselves. The orphans and the widows live humbly, walk, walk in love and mercy. That's what justice looks like to us. That's what God has told us about it. But God's the only one who's qualified to say what is and is not just. He is the only just judge. And at the end of time, for the people who haven't accepted Christ, who are guilty of the sin of unbelief, God has to judge them because they're not covered by the blood of Jesus. The next one we have is that God is merciful. He is infinitely, unchangeably, compassionate, and kind. In the Old Testament, in Romans, or I'm sorry, talking, quoting the Old Testament, Paul says in Romans 9, 15 and 16, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion or pity on whom I will have compassion. So then God's gift is not a question of human will and human effort, but of God's mercy. It depends on, not on one's own willingness nor his strenuous exertion as in running a race, but on God's having mercy upon him. Now that's an Old Testament quote, and people take that wrong. Because God is talking to Moses when he says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. For us in the New Testament, that's everyone who accepts Jesus. It's everyone, honestly. But those who accept Jesus get to reap the reward of it. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 say, It's because of the Lord's mercy and loving kindness that we are not consumed, because his tender compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great and abundant is your stability and faithfulness. So if we've made a mistake, that's fine. We're good at doing that, and we will continue to be good at making mistakes. I spend a lot of my time with me, kind of forced to, and I see me make mistakes all over. I know. But we're being worked on day by day. Philippians 1.5 says that we are continually being worked on until the day of Christ's return. Until we go to be with Jesus or until he comes back to get us, God is working on us and perfecting us. Sometimes we think that God's too long in bringing his plan to fruition. Yes?
Yes. You are right. God is, God doesn't hold grudges. God is forgiving. God is merciful. But human law is still human law. And some people get over-spiritual about it, which I think is kind of interesting. I'm going to use a polite term. And so if someone does, if they're driving 70 through a 50, and they get pulled over, they think, well, God's trying to teach me a lesson. No, the cop caught you. You were speeding. <laughs> Sometimes it's not that complicated. <laughs> Maybe God is trying to teach you a lesson. Don't speed. I mean, there, there's not a big to-do about it. Trying to, oh, is that what it is? Ah, uh, Okay. But sometimes we think God's taking too long in bringing his plan to fruition, but it's because of his mercy. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness. But he is long-suffering, meaning extraordinarily patient toward you and me, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. And God isn't just merciful in the Bible. God is faithful. He's merciful all of the time. And so it is with this next one. God is gracious, meaning he is infinitely and unchangeably inclined to spare the guilty. Now, what, it's one of my favorite things about God, and my favorite example of it is in the book of Jonah. If you go to Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Now, this sounds really good if you take it out of context, but I think, this is my sense of humor, I think it's really funny if you imagine how Jonah says it, the way that Jonah says it. Because God just saved Nineveh, this city of 120,000 people that's in modern-day Iran, through Jonah, who did not want to go to Nineveh. He tried going to Tarshish, which is the exact opposite direction. And God said, I'm sorry, I can't force you to do this, but I'm going to nudge you the way I want you to go. And caused a hurricane on the sea, until Jonah went, yeah, I probably should, you know, get off the boat and go the way I'm supposed to go. And God knew that God, Jonah was going to do that, so he arranged transport for Jonah via a giant fish. That's what it says. Via a giant fish that swallowed Jonah and spat Jonah out on the shore in front of the city walls of Nineveh, which worked wonderfully for Jonah because Nineveh worshipped fish and the ocean. So what is basically a giant version of Nineveh's prophet spat out this guy who's telling them, you're wrong! Follow God! God knows what he's doing and he's got a sense of humor. I love it. But here at the end of it, after God has saved the city of Nineveh, Jonah is sitting there and he says, and it says, he prayed to the Lord and he said, I pray you, O Lord, is not this just what I said when I was still in my country? This is why I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And when sinners turn to you and meet your conditions, you revoke the sentence of evil against them. Now, God is immutable. He never changes. That's still true. The reason Jonah was mad is because he didn't like Nineveh. He still wanted Nineveh to be destroyed after God was gracious and merciful to them. And it kind of ends that way on the chapter, where Jonah's there, sitting on a hill, looking at the city, waiting for God to destroy it. And God tells him, I I'm not going to destroy it. Like, there was 120,000 people that just got spared. Are you really going to be mad with me about that? And Jonah went, yes. Yes, I am. And that's where it ends. <laughs> that's where the book of Jonah ends. Huh? Yeah, it just does. You never, find, you never hear about Jonah outside of that. Jonah's heart, it's easy to say, was in the wrong place. It's why I'm happy that God is God and I'm not God, because I don't know if I would be as gracious and as merciful and loving and kind as God is and good as God is. Odds are, I wouldn't. And that brings, I just segued wonderfully to the next one. God is loving. He infinitely, unchangingly loves us. And if you look at the combination of those last, I think it's four or five, attributes of God, including God is loving. God is good. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is just. He is perfectly wise. All of those are given to us, all of those attributes of God are given to us freely because God loves us. 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. 
this Bible, if you haven't read it front to back, it's got some wonderful stories and wonderful lessons. But this is God's love letter to us. Jesus is in it from front to back. And God is in it the whole time saying, I'm chasing you. In this love story, I am the guy, you're the girl, and I'm chasing you. I'm trying to woo you. I'm trying to love you with perfect love. I want to be everything to you and for you, but I can't if you don't let me. It's a love story that we get to be a part of. In every way that God is infinite and God is omni, in every one of the 5,400 or 7,700 promises in the Bible, depending on which count you go with, they are all answered yes and amen through Jesus Christ because God loves us. He doesn't just love humanity as a whole. He loves humans. He loves us individually, intimately, personally, with a kind of love that we could never hope to mirror. But he does. Just because it pleases him to do so. Same reason he made us. It pleased him to do so. The reason he saved us, it pleased him to do so. And he loves us just as it pleases him to do so. And now, the next point we've got is that God is holy. Holy. Not Swiss cheese holy. H-O-L-Y holy. Hymnal holy. It means he is infinitely and unchangeably perfect. In Revelation 4, 8, it says, And the four living creatures, individually having six wings, were full of eyes all over and within, underneath their wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, omnipotent, who was and who is and who is to come. And in Isaiah 6, 3, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy means set apart by or for God. Sacred, unlike others. Different. It comes from a word meaning to venerate and revere, to hold in reverence, to hold in awe. And in Psalm 22, a prophetic psalm about Jesus' crucifixion, God's holiness is still present. Because in Psalm 22, 1 through 3, David wrote, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the wounds of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you answer not. And by night I am not silent or find no rest. But you are holy. Oh, you who dwell in the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered. The psalmist answers their own question. They give themselves the answer. And we know that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From Jesus' crucifixion, it says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. I don't speak Aramaic, so that accent is probably wrong. And, we, and I've heard whole sermons preached about, well, God had separated himself from the Son because he couldn't bear to look on the sin of the world, and that's why there was darkness all over the land, and that's why there were storms and all of this. When Jesus said that, he was trying to explain to us, he was trying to call back to this psalm for the Jews who were present so that they would have a glimmer of understanding of what was happening in front of them. And he answers his question, God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far? But God, you are holy. You're perfect. Oh, you who dwell in the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered. Because God's holiness is unique to him. He is endlessly, always perfect. Sometimes we don't understand what's going on. We're confused and we're angry and we're hurt. And we don't want to go to God. We don't want to trust him because it seems that he has failed us either in our expectations or in his actions because we can't see it. 
And we're trying to understand God who is beyond our understanding. And sometimes the answer is, God, you're holy. I don't know what's going on. I don't like not knowing. But I know that you are good. I know that you love me and you are always working for me, never against me. You are on my side. And even though I'm upset about this right now in my emotions, my emotions are temporary and they are not always true. But what's true, God, is that you are holy. You are perfect. And I praise you because you are holy and perfect. And because you are faithful to me when I'm not faithful to you. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, You, therefore, will be perfect, growing into spiritual maturity both in mind and character, actively integrating godly values into your daily life as your Father in heaven is perfect. And in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, Peter writes, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Be set apart from the world by your godly character and mo and moral courage. For it is written, you shall be holy or set apart, for I am holy. God's perfect. And his standard is perfection. Even God's wrath is holy because God's wrath works against whatever is unholy. Without Jesus, you and I won't ever be perfect. Faith is what makes us perfect and is what is accounted to us as righteousness or right standing with God. Because of Jesus, assuming you've accepted him as your savior, you and I will never have to experience God's holy wrath. Because Jesus had to be the perfect sacrifice for us to receive salvation and praise God that he was. And the last numbered one I have which is up to 15 if you're keeping count, is that God is glorious. He is infinitely beautiful and great. You know, we talked about this a little bit in when we covered Beautiful Outlaw, where we talked about the different personality elements of Jesus, how he was playful and he was human and he was cunning and he was free and he was righteous and he was all of these things. And if you think about all of God's attributes as a clear prism that white light shines into, a clear prism refracts white light into a rainbow. The best visualization I have for you is to think of the Dark Side of the Moon album cover, because that's the concept. And our response now, if you put a colored prism in there, you only get one color out. If you only focus on God's perfection, you are only going to see God's perfection. You will miss all the rest of it. If you only focus on that God is love, that's what you'll see. You'll miss all the rest of it. But if you keep that prism clear and free from false conceptions and wrong religious teaching, our response to God being God and being true to himself is that he is beautiful. There is none like him. And he is great. He's not just good. He is great. In Habakkuk 3, verses 3 through 4, and approaching from Sinai came, came and God, approaching from Sinai, came from Taman, which represents Edom, and the Holy One from Mount Paran in the Sinai region. His glory covered the heavens and the earth and was full of of his praise and his brightness was like the sunlight rays streamed from his hand and there in the sunlight splendor was the hiding place of his power and revelation 1 verses 12 through 16 then i turned to see the voice that was speaking with me and after turning i saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands i saw someone like the son of man dressed in a robe reaching to his feet with a golden sash wrapped about his, around his chest. His head and his hair were white like white wool, glistening white like snow. And his all-seeing eyes were flashing like a flame piercing into my being. 
His feet were like burnished, burnished white hot bronze, refined in a fur- furnace, and his voice was powerful, like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment, and his face reflecting his majesty and the Shekinah glory was like the sun shining in all of its power at midday. Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the dominion, for you created all things. And by your will, they were brought into being and were created. When we see God for who he is, when we encounter him in his full majesty and authority, it is beautiful. His truth is beautiful. And his truth, that bright light, sometimes people run from it because it scares them. That in that light, there is no hiding. In the fullness of God, we look so small and so frail and so weak. And if God weren't a loving God, if God were a cruel and unkind, kind God we wouldn't stand a chance but praise God that he is not that that he is all of these attributes we've talked about that he is self-existing he is unchanging he is self-sufficient he is all powerful all present and all knowing wise just good gracious merciful, loving, and holy. And all of them working on our behalf. All of them working in us and through us and for us. I'm not going to read them, but some good, another good set of scriptures to read is Revelation 5, 11 through 14. Where in verse 12, I'll read verse 12. The elders around the throne say in a loud voice, Worthy and deserving is the Lamb that was sacrificed to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. In verse, the second half of verse 13, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Christ, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And in Acts 9, 3, as he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around, him, displaying the glory and majesty of Christ. God's glory is that brilliant and blinding light that Saul encountered on the Damascus road. A light so bright that even in the middle of the day, it it blinded him. And there are a few other things to know before we go. The first, and this wasn't listed in any attribute section of God that I could find, but I, it is an attribute of God. It is a characteristic of God. Is that God is emotional. You get around a bunch of old school religious people and they'll think, I have to be stoic because God is holy and my weakness is not good. I can't show weakness, but in my weakness, he's strong. In the Bible, God is described as feeling love, hate, jealousy, joy, grief, and compassion among a list of so many more. God even laughs in the Bible. And we know that Jesus is the perfect image of our invisible God. And Jesus was completely human and emotional. Jesus felt every emotion that you and I are ever going to have. Don't shut off your emotions or believe the lie that God is not emotional. God's never cold and rational towards us or unfeeling and inconsiderate of our struggle. He knows those things firsthand through Christ the Son. And you're made in God's image. Having emotion is a part of that. The trick is to make sure that you have your emotions and your emotions don't have you. And the second I touched on, and I've mentioned this continuously tonight, is that for all of his attributes, 
God the Father is for you. I don't know if you've never heard it before, but in case you haven't, God's not mad at you. God is madly in love with you. Your earthly father might have left much to be desired. Your heavenly father is perfect. Your heavenly father lacks nothing. He will never leave you, never forsake you. He is forever working in and on and through you, assuming that you let him. If you, if you need to know more about him, you could ask me or you could ask Pastor Bob or someone else who's led by the Holy Spirit. But a, the best way I know to get to know God is to spend time with the man. Spend time with our Savior and our King. Spend time with him in his word. And the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. He will give you revelation knowledge. Spend time with God in prayer. Just, just talking to God and waiting for him to answer. But otherwise, if only one person talks, it's a monologue. It's hard to have a conversation that way with someone who won't stop talking and then leaves. <laughs> Spending time with God in praise and worship. Even if it's the sacrifice of praise that Hebrews 13, 15 talks about. But spend quiet time with God and bask in His presence. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Be still and know that He is God. And while I'm very confident about the people who are here in person, I don't know everyone who's online. I, don't, I can't even tell who's watching online. All the cameras face away from me. And if you've never heard anything about this before and you want to start your relationship with God, folks, it's so simple. God made it. It's, all, it's so simple, it's almost stupid. That's how I say it. It starts by accepting Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. It is a two-step, all-done process. If you go to Romans 10.9, that I quote so very often, it explains the whole process to us. It's in Romans 10.9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. There's nothing extra. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to stand up and join the choir. You don't have to do anything beyond that. You don't have to follow all the rules. It's preferred, but you don't have to. Well, I mean, we talked about speeding earlier. <laughs> God made it that simple. And part of why God made it that simple is because it takes faith. It doesn't require checking off a list, ticking off all the boxes, even though they make us feel good, because I like getting to the end of a list. It's two things. And if you want rules, there are two of them. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And if by chance you don't love yourself very much, I pray that God would show you how he sees you through the blood of Jesus. Because he sees you as perfect. He sees you as his favorite kid. And he can't wait to spend eternity with you. If you would, so we're going to close this up. If y'all be kind enough to bow your head, close your eyes, I'm going to say a prayer, speak a benediction. And if anyone would like prayer or to discuss any part of the sermon, I will be up here for a few minutes. If you feel like giving money, there's a plate behind me. If you're watching online, you can always message us uh, through our Facebook page. We respond pretty quickly. At least I try to. And if you want to give online, you can go to heartofgodfellowship.com, go to the online giving tab. It's very self-explanatory. Thank you all for being patient with me. I get sidetracked now and again. God, thank you so much for who you are, just for being who you are and loving us the way that you love us. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we get the benefit of your promises, of your love, of your mercy, of everything that you are. God, I thank you that this word tonight hasn't been just me mouthing off, but God, that you would use it, that this message would be good seed scattered into good soil, that it would take root and bear fruit in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would look more like Jesus in all that we say, everything we do, the way we act, and the things that we think. 
Father, I thank you that we would come to know Jesus better and love him the best. Father, I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they will say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. amen. That is a wonderful thing to hear. I love you all terribly. There is nothing you can do to stop me. Have a fantastic rest of your week, and God bless you.